you keep your mics you keep your mics off while uh, while our speakers are speaking and if you've got any chat uh, any questions that you particularly want to raise then put those in the chat and we'll we'll try to deal with them when we come to the the latter part of the session which is when we will have a sort of open q and a discussion section where you'll be able to uh, put your questions in person to the speakers uh, and um uh, have more general chat if if people have anything they they want to share with others uh, or what what have you right now alana i don't know whether you're still able to listen to me but could you start sharing your screen now uh, with the presentation you had up before we were having one or two technical difficulties before we let you all know there we go so the screen's now started showing. right so our speakers this evening are we, we've got we've got uh, three general speakers uh and as we've got alana who's a project officer at greenways who's overseeing things and taking control of the presentation so we've got james uh principal ecologist tom russell grant who many of you will know i know has been here for a few years who's tree and woodland officer and ellen pasquier who's the uh, a team leader on the tree projects anyway i'm sure they're more than capable of introducing themselves so i won't say any more and i'm sure you'd rather listen to them so james it's over to you as our as our first presenter okay thanks Pete. I can't actually see the presentation yet. I don't know if anybody else can. I, I have it up on my screen, I have to say. Yes, I can see it as well. Yeah, I can oh, okay. see it, James. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. <laughs> That's interesting. <a> yeah. <laughs> I could see it earlier. Uh you'll have to trust us. We're on the biodiversity net gain and nature recovery in Norfolk um screen. Yeah. Okay. Um shall I send it to you, James, by on Teams? If you still have teams. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, I'm not sure why I can't see it. It says Alana has started screen sharing, but I can't actually see, see that. It's a black screen or a... Yeah, black screen, yeah. I should think it should be coming then, hopefully. Yeah. Anyway, introduce yourself, James. You can anyway, talk a yeah. Bit while, while we're waiting, let me do time. that and hope it's loading. Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. Th thanks, Pete. I'm James Fisher. I'm the principal ecologist at Norfolk County Council, um, in uh, the natural environment team within the Environment Service. Um, so yeah, kind of. I suppose um, the main focus of my role is um, providing ecological support and input to the planning system. Um, we get consulted on a lot of planning applications, uh, particularly around major infrastructure schemes um you know we, we, we look at minerals and waste planning applications and uh, new schools new highways schemes that sorts of thing and, and also some of the nationally significant infrastructure projects as well so that's things like um you know it can be quite contentious like new pylons and um uh new, new sort of cabling and to, to offshore wind turbines uh, farms that sort of thing so yeah we get involved with a, a wide range of interesting projects um and we also provide uh ecological support to other teams within our um, service as well so whether that's things like um, our trails and, and, and greenways teams as well and sort of looking at protected species issues such as whether it's like badgers on the merits way or something like that so yeah we get get, get involved with a wide range of um, of, of interesting projects um, okay I still can't see the screen what I might do is if I just go to that link that I've just been sent I will use that um, if you just bear with me um just um don't know why it's not showing for me just bear with me i'm just going to open it up so i can see what i'm talking about <laughs> um, but uh yeah um okay i'm just opening up a powerpoint presentation that i'll be able to see myself so i can um talk through that bear with me um but yeah um again just to give a bit of context um and yeah uh the idea will be that i'm giving a sort of a bit of um a, an overview of what we're doing at a sort of county-wide strategic level for um not only trees and woodlands but 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 other um habitats as well um and i'll just be talking about that kind of bigger picture strategic work i'm involved with around biodiversity net gain and the um local nature recovery strategy for norfolk and then uh, as we move on to the other presentations we'll be looking at um uh, i suppose drilling down to a bit more detail um on on some of those particular um schemes uh, around sort of trees and woodlands so yeah i'll just okay i can see what i'm talking about now so that's really helpful <laughs> um so yeah if we just move on to, uh, sorry i'm 
yeah, I can't see what you can see, but this should be um, the, the next slide, which is what is biodiversity net gain. Just can somebody yes. say, can you see that? Yeah, great. Yes. Um, so yeah, uh, what is biodiversity net gain? Um, it relates to the planning system. So it's about making sure that new development um, leaves the natural environment in a measurably better state than it was beforehand. And that word measurably is really important because up until recently, before the Environment Act came into force in 2021, we were reliant on the national planning policy framework, which was really encouraging net gain wherever possible, but not in a measurable way. Um, so th this is kind of a real step forward now. Hopefully we can start to get some real sort of measurable benefits for the natural environment through as a result of, of development. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, um, there should be an image of some uh, bulldozers <laughs> and uh, new habitat creation. Um, so yeah, what's required? So um, the, the legislation will require that uh, there'll be an increase of a minimum 10% uh, improvement in the natural environment after a development takes place from the the, the, the starting position. So, um, you know, it, it's a sort of, it's a small shift, but significant in that we're now be able to um, sort of put a value to. It's it's a it's a tricky situation, but we're essentially um, uh, yeah put, put putting a value to, to or, or yeah valuing our habitats more. I think that are being potentially impacted on by development and and then. Measure, having a measurable improvement as an outcome of, of, of that new development and using something called the biodiversity metric, which I'll just explain a bit more about in a moment. Um, and also another important part of this is that any habitats that are created are legally secured um, for a minimum 30 years, hopefully in perpetuity, um, to, to make sure you know they're not developed on again in five years time or something like that. So that that's really important to, to, to bear in mind. Um, the next slide is, uh, I, I just want to sort of talk about where this will all go. So, um, d you know, d developers will be encouraged to provide their um, their habitats, wildlife areas within the development footprint, within their red line boundary, um, or, or on site, uh, wherever possible. And that's um, that basically is encouraged through you know through through the weighting within the, the biodiversity metric I mentioned. Um, however, it's accepted where that's not always possible. Um, We'll, we'll be looking to create some new habitats off off site, and um, the 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 new local nature recovery strategy, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, is is going to start to identify where we think the most important locations are for creating new habitats. Um, and the image you can see there is 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 sort of picked out from the Lawton report, which was a really key influential document released um, a number of years ago, or about ten years ago now. Um, but it's about creating um, bigger wildlife habitats, more of them, are better joined up and connected. And, and that's where we, we, we'll be wanting to target our new habitat creation that's being generated through impacts of development. So that's what the local nature recovery strategy will, will set out, where we want to see these new areas of habitat being created and improved. Um, yeah, and, and just a sort of bit of detail there, where, where a developer is creating something, a new area of habitat outside of their you know, development site, um, it will be a very transparent process. So there'll be um, Natural England have set up a, a biodiversity gain site register. So if a, for example, a new woodland is created um, uh, off site, so should we say, um, you'll be able to go onto this publicly accessible um, uh, net gain register and it will link that particular habitat to a particular development and a planning application. So in theory, it should be a nice kind of a, a transparent process and we can sort of see um, exactly what which development is 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 basically funding new habitat creation. Um, so yeah, that that that's kind of in a nutshell what what's 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 happening. Um, there there is something called statutory credits, which is a bit of a fallback position where if a developer can't find any suitable areas to create new habitat, they can purchase these statutory credits from direct from government, but they are deliberately set at a much higher um, cost so to discourage that you know developers from going down that route but essentially that is a kind of fallback position if if if, if they can't find anything else nearby um so next slide is about who is going to be providing these new off-site biodiversity habitats and um one of the key providers in norfolk at the moment uh, that we're aware of is is the wendling beck environment project which i don't know if anyone's aware of but that that one is um near Gresson Hall, uh, Durham, 
in, in Breckland district. Um, and, and they are essentially, they've mapped out a, quite a large area of, um, much of it is at the moment quite intense to be managed arable farmland. Um, and they're looking to create a, a wide range of new valuable wildlife habitats, which essentially development will pay for. Um, so that's really exciting. And we expect more farmers, landowners to come forward as this starts to, um, you know, kick in um, as, 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 a, as a legal requirement for developers to, to deliver net gain. And um, I've said here, you know, um, local authorities could enter this net gain market if they're interested, but even anyone who owns land, whether that's a parish town council, could also consider this. Um, there's a bit of an undertaking involved. You need to record your, you know, you know, need to own some land, have somewhere suitable where you feel like you can create something and enhance it. Um, so, like I say, it could be a, um, a, a, a an arable farm land with low biodiversity value that you create new, you know, plant trees on, create new woodland on, um, and you can sort of go through that process of, um, you know, entering into agreement with a with a developer to to to, to fund. Uh, the long-term maintenance and management of, of that habitat and um, it, it could be yeah potentially a good opportunity uh, like I said there will be some sort of legal setup fees involved so not something to be undertaken lightly but equally it could it could be a really good opportunity um, for those who are um, interested in that. Um, so the next slide uh, I think it's my last one on net gain just to talk about the time scales really so um, I've said here November 23 is when we're expecting section, secondary legislation with all the guidance about net gain becoming mandatory. That's just been released this afternoon, so <laughs> we've not even had a chance to read it properly yet. But um, yeah, that, that's that's all now in place. So what will now happen, the next step will be that it will become a, a mandatory legal requirement for all new major developments um, from January next year. Uh, we'll need to, like I say, to deliver a 10% minimum uh, in, improvement on on uh, in net gain across their as a result of their development using that biodiversity metric as a tool to measure it. Um, then the, the kind of next timeline after that is April when it will apply to all planning applications, so even, even minor schemes as well. So yeah, hopefully we'll have had a few months to get used to the, <laughs> the scheme by that point and, and it'll be a, a smooth process. Um, and then finally, the kind of the, I suppose the other one that's not mentioned is an, uh, for a couple of years is the, these nationally significant infrastructure projects, and that's where you've got sort of um, major new uh, road rail schemes, um, or like I say, things like offshore wind turbines, that sort of thing. Um, they aren't legally required to become uh, to, to, to deliver net gain until uh, the year after next, but a lot of them, to be fair, are already starting to to, to sort of do enter. Ent you know this approach in a voluntary manner so yeah hope, hopefully that, that that will kind of um move along quite quickly soon um so that's all i want to say about net gain and i appreciate it. i don't want to take up too much of everyone's time but just a couple of slides also um to talk about the uh local nature recovery strategy um this also came out of the environment acts um and it's um it, it's a really exciting opportunity now for each county to set out how it wants to see kind of look at a landscape scale to tackle nature's recovery in a strategic way ac across each county um norfolk county council has been tasked with developing a, a nature recovery strategy for norfolk um and uh as yeah say so, uh, we was re the responsible authority um and yeah like i said really good opportunity to look at not only uh, biodiversity and wildlife opportunities but also climate change issues looking at um, flood protection and, and pollution prevention, that sort of thing, um, and, and access to nature as well. So we can kind of hopefully kind of bundle up all these benefits and, and, and start to map out, um, you know, firstly, yeah, what our priorities are as a county and then where our existing important areas are. But I think more importantly, where we see the opportunities to create and connect those areas are. So that's going to be the kind of really exciting step as we start to map all this out and uh, generate some interesting sort of, sort of proposals for that. Um, so if I just move on to the next slide, um, it's going to be how once we've got this strategy in place, it's going to be a really good opportunity to start to channel some investment to actually make this become a reality. And not only I mentioned biodiversity net gain investment, that's that's one funding mechanism, but also um, the new agri-environment scheme, um, environmental management schemes will help deliver some of this. 
Um, th there's kind of various other opportunities across across Norfolk as well. And you know, it could be not only public finance but private investment. You know, so a broad range of investment to deliver these uh, th th these new sort of vision of of, of habitats um, improvements across Norfolk. Um, and that, yeah, as I said, it can kind of we'll, we'll be looking at those kind of broader benefits, nature based solutions um, to, 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 as as part of that package. And then the document again, it's not going to sit on a shelf gathering dust. It'll be really practical, um, you know a live document kept up to date and, and, and be really useful. And it will also help that on the, in the planning system as well, guiding where new development should go through new local plans. So making sure we're not um, sort of developing on areas which we see as key connections or you know parts of a connective uh, corridor, for example. So yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll see some really useful and um, practical uses of, of this nature recovery strategy. Um, and just going on to sort of my last slide really, um, just to sort of explain a bit about where, where you know where where we're at with it is um we're, we're early we're early stage with it we expect it's going to take at least 12 to 18 months to sort of finalize but through that process there'll be a really good opportunity for everyone to engage with it um we we are working directly with the district councils who are these sort of official supporting authorities but you know we'll be working with um landowners managers um uh, you know, con nature conservation organisations, but you know, e everyone in the you know who's who's got an interest in this, could, you know, will have an opportunity to get involved. Whether that is the you know parish and town councils, for example, will have you know there'll be some good consultation on this. We anticipate for everyone to sort of feed in their thoughts on this, and you know, I, I think it'd be yeah really good to sort of look at um you know how the join up with with neighbourhood plans, for example, and how it can help you know because there's some really good ones that have already been done, and this could you know, be supported by those. So yeah, we want to make sure it's all joined up as best as possible, really. Um, and we have got, uh, I've, I've just mentioned here, Andy Miller, who's who's working across North Kent Suffolk, actually, because we're, we're joining up or making sure we've got a good relationship across with Suffolk there um, to make sure this is all nicely fits together um, across, across the border there. So um, he's going to be a key contact. Um, but yeah, um, I think yeah, as things start to move uh, in, in in the next few months, um, you'll you'll hear much more about uh, this nature recovery network and, and, and Norfolk's nature recovery strategy. So, yeah, that's what I wanted to say on those on those two subjects. And I think we'll sort of hopefully move on to a sort of bit more detail around uh, trees and woodlands as, uh, on the next um, presentations. But yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. Okay, now it's over, over to Tom to talk about, about his aspects of trees. Yeah, great. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, James. Um, so yes, I'm Tom Russell Grant. Um, I'm the tree and woodland um, uh, lead for Norfolk County Council. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about the, the health and resilience of, of Norfolk's roadside trees. Um, so on the next slide, you can see what really started our sort of interest in 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 this in in looking at tree populations as a whole and the impacts of of the loss of a single species so um ash dieback came into the uk a few years back um and ash is thought to be the second most populous tree in the the uk um and ash dieback's got the potential to to kill 95% of the trees ash trees so that's a really significant impact um, and it really differs from our, our business as usual way of, of, of really sort of managing tree health and safety. Um, and that's really shown in, in you know, great sort of a, 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 a focus when you think of our road network. There are lots of trees that line the roads. Um, many of those are, are, are ash. And there's um, a real health and safety issue if ash trees you know, fall across the road and, and people driving into them. We at the county council have got a responsibility to, to keep those, those roads safe and to, to be able to sort of encourage landowners um, of, of dangerous trees to, to make them safe. Um, so what of ash dieback? Why, you know, what, what's, what is it? It's um, a fungal disease. Um, it's, it's sort of, it's fairly self-explanatory. It does, it does cause dieback in the crown of the tree. Um, it starts off in the leaves and, and works its way down through the, the, the smaller leaflets and, and branches. Um, and on the next slide, you can see that in bigger detail um, on, on the whole trees. So this is what we're really interested in in terms of highway 
you know, safety. On the top left, there's a tree that's um, got no dieback, 0% um, dieback, through to the bottom right where there's a tree 100% dieback and uh, dead. Now, trees that have got more than 50% dieback, just as a rule of thumb, that's that's where um, interventions, you know, starting to be, you know, a, a good idea. Um, uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean felling a tree. Um, it may be reducing the branches. Um, it may be, you know, perhaps pollarding the tree um, or it may be be simply recording the condition of it. Um, it's really good to inspect ash trees in the summer when they're in leaf and you can see what their, their, their physiological conditions like. You can then track the progress of the tree over years. Um, some trees actually recover from the disease, so it's not a straightforward management um, um, of ash. <laughs> On the next slide, um, you can see the fungal fruiting bodies. Um, um, so these are tiny, tiny little um, mushrooms and they spread millions, billions of spores um, uh, across the environment. So um, ash dieback is, 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 is sort of everywhere. Um, it's not possible to contain the disease anymore. Um, so we need to, 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 to live with it. And on the next slide, you can see a really simple sort of illustration of what, you know, uh, uh, what we can do to help ash, ash trees. On the right hand side, there's a, a really healthy, vigorous ash tree with no dieback at all. Um, and on the left, there's a, a, a tree, a group of trees with quite a bit of um, dieback. And this is in an area where there's, you know, many, many, many trees have been impacted by ash dieback. And most of them, are, 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 you know, have got over 50 percent um, um, dieback. So it's really important not to fell the tree that's healthy. That's got genetic resistance. We want that to get passed on um, 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 to its uh, uh, sort of sons and daughters um, and those are going to be the trees that over time are going to repopulate our countryside with with ash trees we need to keep that diversity in the population and not just fell every single ash tree um, can I have the next slide please so this is a bit depressing I'm afraid um, this is just a graph um, from 1950 um, showing the progression of new tree um, pests and diseases um, and there's a real increase over time um, that's largely due to, to new diseases and um, finding their way here through an increase in um, you know sort of transport more materials coming through wooden packing cases for example um, harbour some some um, insects um, but a large part is is now through um, the plant trade and new you know trees and shrubs coming in from uh, countries that have got diseases and they just get a free ride into our country where they've um, they've got a whole new suite of, 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 of trees and shrubs to um, to sort of host on. Um, next slide please. So one of the, the newish diseases, when I say new, it's actually it was off that off that chart it was in the 1940s this this arrived in the the uk um it's a disease called city bark of um, um sycamore um it's another fungal disease um it actually is is present in quite a few of our sycamores um so a lot of trees already have this fungus within them it's a latent fungus and it only become symptomatic they only only show sort of signs of, of of problem um when they're triggered and the trigger for this is is drought conditions um, and when when that happens, um, the, the 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 tree you know dies back very suddenly, um, and you get this sort of sooty bark effect. Um, next slide, please. So to start with, we were really interested in ash dieback, um, and this is just a map showing where we found um, trees in two thousand and twenty one um, next to the road where they needed some some work. The green blobs are ash trees with ash dieback. Uh, the orange blobs um, are elm trees that are suffering from Dutch elm disease. So they tend to be quite, you know, small, those trees. They're the, the, the regenerating suckers from um, previous um, um, elms that have succumbed to, to Dutch elm disease. Um, and there's just one black blob in there just to the east of Norwich. Um, and that's one tree with sooty bark disease. Um, um, so this is a, the situation in 2021. Um, in the next slide, you can see the following year. This is 2022. Um, so a similar sort of mixture of, of, of Dutch elm disease and ash dieback, that proportion stayed similar, but quite a few more um, cases of sooty bark disease. 
Now we, we prioritize our inspections. So we, we, we sort of rotate around the, the county. So don't, don't worry about the, you know, there's more, more blobs in the north of the county. That's just because we, we, we change the focus of where we inspect. Um, and we target our inspections on the trees that we know have got the, the most, um, the roads that have got the most trees on and are the most important um, roads. So we can sort of focus in a little bit um, 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 each year to, 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 to really, you know, get the, the, the best safety outcome from our inspections. Um, so there's a few more city bark diseases there, uh, disease trees, and that was in the, the year of the droughts. Uh, next slide, please, um, shows the, the sort of the results from this, this summer's surveys. Um, and you can see there's been quite a, a, a significant increase in the number of, of sycamores affected. So we're expecting that um, to continue next summer as well um, before that will gradually sort of taper off and, um, and, and, and that sort of, you know, bump of the disease cycle will, will sort of even out again. Um, so those are a few, you know, a, a few diseases that we're, we're grappling with at the minute, but, but what's around the corner? Um, next slide um, shows uh, oak processionary moth. Um, this isn't such a big problem for the trees, but it is for, for people. Um, the caterpillars release irritant hairs that cause problems to respiratory system um, and also um, and cause significant skin irritation, um, which can hospitalize people. Um, uh, next slide, please. So this has been introduced into the UK, into London. Um, it, it had a free ride on some imported um, oak trees. They were quite big trees imported from the continent um, and they came with with either the eggs or some young caterpillars on um, so from that that single um, 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 point of sort of entry it's it's now endemic through London um, and marching its way through uh, Essex and Suffolk so um, we will be seeing these uh, 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 caterpillars and moths in Norfolk sometime um, soon next slide so while um, um, we're not able to, 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 to necessarily, you know, detect them when they do arrive. Um, we, we at least need to have a look and <laughs> we'll focus some, some, uh, uh, efforts on the, the Suffolk border, um, during our roadside surveys, um, identifying trees that are really suitable to, to host oak processionary moth, um, ones that we can see as well. It's quite important. Um, so we haven't found any, which is great. Um, and it's not, it's not only a question of us us trying to 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 to, to look to to find them to um, give us a, a head start on managing the disease, um, but it's also so that our tree inspectors get used to looking for them because it's quite a different uh, uh, thing to look out for. They're they're very small. You've got to really you know make an effort to try and find them. Um, and so far, you know, we 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 are clear there aren't any known reporting uh, sightings in 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 Norfolk, which is great. Next slide. Um, so this shows uh, a, a real nasty, um, it's the Asian longhorn beetle. There's a few um, longhorn beetles that uh, are, are knocking on the, the sort of the doors of the UK to come in. Um, we've also got native longhorn beetles, which don't cause a problem. So, you know, don't get confused with those. Um, now, the strategy of, of, of this insect is completely different. It lays its eggs on, on, on the host trees and they develop into larvae which live under the bark of the tree um, eating away at the, 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 the wood of, um, of um, the host tree. And in the next slide you can see um, the effect of that uh, uh, when the adults emerge. Um, now the, that's a, an exit hole, you can see those, those sort of like someone's fired a shotgun at the tree. Um, those are all the exit holes of of, of adults um, um, flying away from the tree to um, lay their eggs on 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 other trees. So this is a um, an insect that has been imported and and found in the UK and successfully eradicated. Um, and that's quite a, a, a tricky business that involves chopping down the infected tree, but also um, a range of other host trees in the immediate area. Um, and and um, you know disposing of that wood, um, it's quite a destructive thing to do. Um, but that has been a successful eradication, which is is actually quite rare when you're getting new new tree diseases and pests in the UK. Um, next slide, please. Uh, it's not just insects and um, um, uh, 
fungi um, bacteria are also causing problems um Xylella fastidiosa is is in europe um it's likely to come come this way um and that affects a wide range of host plants not just trees but shrubs and ornamental plants so that's um, going to have a very significant impact on our both our natural environment but also the, the horticultural trade and and nurseries um so the best thing is 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 to try not to let any of these these um, pests and diseases in in the first place. Um, next slide. Um, if you aren't sure about a, a, a tree, the best thing to do is to find out a bit more about it. And um, these are all links that will be sent round to you. Um, I should have mentioned that at the beginning, so you can have a look at these resources after after today. Um, and the forest forestry commission and forest research. Um, have, have got a really good suite of information there and and explain how to report um, pests and diseases. Um, you know, if you're not sure about what something is, then please go to, to them. Um, so this has all been a bit, yeah, it's a bit gloomy, really. Um, but there is positive action that you can take. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, the simple you know, most important um, thing you can do is to find good locations for, for new trees, for young trees to grow. Um, we need to have a, a wide range of tree species. We don't want monocultures. We don't just want the single um, species, you know, everywhere. And um, that's that's a real uh, a target for, for a pest and disease. We want a nice mixture. We want a nice mixture of, of, of age ranges as well. Um, and above all, when we're planting these trees, we, we really don't want to be importing any more of these nasty pests and diseases. So um, the best advice is to um, source your trees um, from UK sourced and grown stock. Um, it is possible to import trees, but it needs to go through a, a period of quarantine. Um, so if you can find a, a supplier um, of, of plant healthy certified trees, um, then that's excellent. And if you're able to find a way of, of um, sourcing some discounted trees where you're not paying the whole price, um, then, then that's even better. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and I'll hand over to um, Helen, who's going to talk about some um, tree offers we've got. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, yeah, so I'm Hélène Pasquier. I'm the team leader uh, tree projects um, at the in the environment team at Norfolk County Council. You probably might hear very, very slight French accent, uh, but yeah, that's that's normal. <laughs> so today I wanted to speak to you about the one million trees for Norfolk project. We have um, an, a target as a council to plant one million trees. And I wanted especially to look through tonight the different schemes that we have currently open for everyone to support that target and start planting trees. Thank you, Elena. So just a little, a few words about the One Million Tree Project. It has been approved at Cabinet in November 2019. So far, we have planted uh, a little bit less than 290,000 trees on hedges. Uh, but we have to remember that obviously we had COVID that, um, you know, stopped activities for, for a few months. You can see on the screen, we've got an interactive map which shows the progress of where the, those trees have been planted. And we update that map really regularly. So it's online. So you have the link on the slide and you have this little a planet where I've put also the link towards, um, you know, all the numbers and uh, progress around planting. Thank you, Alana. Next slide. So I'm going to now start to speak about the different schemes that we have available. And just to follow up on what Tom has just said, all the schemes that we are going to look through tonight, we really looked at, you know, took into consideration uh, the, the risk around pests and disease. And um, we really uh, asked people to, um, 
to for, to to source their trees from a plant healthy um, nursery, or otherwise to make sure that it's, it has not been imported and it's UK sourced. So the first scheme uh, to speak about tonight is the subsidized tree pack scheme. So that's a scheme that is open to everyone in Norfolk. And basically, we've managed to um, get a good deal with local suppliers. And we are uh, offering trees that are 50% of their original costs. And currently, it works around 50p per tree for most of the packs. So as you can see online, there are five different tree packs. So we, you have the hetero pack, wildlife tree pack, small urban trees. You can find some taller trees packs. And we also have some orchard packs. There are different number of trees in packs. So it ranges from six to 125. And really, um, you know, if there are too many trees in the pack that you've chosen, you're more than welcome to share it with family and friends, neighbors. Um, so that's, that's, that's a current offer. The only requirement that we have is for you to have the space, obviously, to plant the trees and the right land permissions. The scheme is currently open until the 4th of January. Um, and that's a scheme that we uh, run quite successfully last year. Last year, we managed to uh, have, um, a, you know, people around Norfolk um, bought some trees and we, we managed to sell around 33,000 trees last year, which is really good in terms of contributing to our target of planting 1 million trees. Next slide, please. The next um, scheme is the Bursay Community Grant for Norfolk. So we've been really lucky uh, to have uh, the Bursay family who have a, 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 business, a business locally to offer us um, 10,000 pounds that we can now offer a grant for people to apply. So we are basically administering the grant for the Busse family. So that's a grant where anyone in Norfolk can apply, but really we're looking at planting schemes that show community benefits. So, you know, for example, if you're working with volunteers to plant the trees or to maintain the trees, or uh, if, if, you know, if it's a project around planting trees in a school, for example, uh, around, you know, supporting education, um, that's definitely the type of project we would want to support through this grant. The maximum grant per application is 2,500. And we support, we, we can fund 100% of uh, buying the actual trees and tree protection. It's fairly open. You can buy some orchard, single trees, small woodlands, shelter belts, and rows. But what we cannot fund is hedgerows because there's already quite a good deal with um, subsidized tree scheme, which I've just presented. So it's currently open until the 4th of January, but obviously we only have £10,000 available. So, um, you know, once the money run out, we, we will close uh, the scheme. Next slide, please. The next scheme we have is really targeted to North Norfolk and Breckland. Um, so basically, we are part of a um, kind of a research project, which is called Trees Outside Woodland. And it's very interesting because they're really trying um, kind of innovative ways of tree planting outside of woodlands. And this year we're trying to, um, to so basically they've created a map and they have identified key locations when, where you plant trees, it will really support habitat connectivity to support a more joined up landscape. So they've, they've, they've identified kind of um, um, gaps. Um, so there's a map online. So again, there's a link on the, um, on the slides. 
uh, but everyone who is part of, uh, who are part of the selected areas can apply and we can fund 100% uh, of uh, tree planting uh, on there. The type of tree planting that can be found is infield trees, individual trees, hedgerows, tree within hedgerows, small wooded areas, and orchards. And as I said, so it covers, the, the fund covers 100% of the actual, buying the actual trees, tree protection, and also labor, so planting costs. So that's quite, quite useful. Uh, what we cannot support because this project is around trees outside woodland, so we cannot support any uh, woodland planting. Um, also, if it's part of a planning consent, you know, that you have to plant trees, we would not support those kind of applications. And also, if it's uh, planting, um, you know, if it's because a tree has fell, we would not be able to support that either. Next slide. Yeah, so another way of, you know, managing to find some trees, um, I'm not sure if you know, but we've got a tree nursery, community tree nursery in Grayson Hall, and it's run by volunteers. And basically they have been selecting, uh, you know, finding seeds in Norfolk and, um, growing some trees from seeds. And they now have some whips available to sell. So uh, the trees are around one pound and there's a minimum of five trees uh, that you can order. You can, uh, actually it's a very lovely place to visit. So if you're around Grayson Hall and you want to visit the tree nursery, you're more than welcome. Uh, you could also um, directly purchase your trees from the tree nursery, or we can also organize for you to pick up uh, the trees in Norwich. And currently at the nurseries, they've been um, growing some alder, alder buck zone, birch, black zone, elder, English oak, goat willow, horse chestnut, sweet chestnut, rowan, and walnuts. But I know they also have some more species available. So I think it's really worth to um, send them uh, an email. So I cannot completely see the slide because there's something. Um, but basically on the slide, there's the email address uh, where you can uh, contact. So hopefully when you will uh, get the slides sent to you, you will see the full the full screen. Uh, but yeah, currently it's hidden. Um, but I think it's treeproject at norfolk.gov.uk. So if you're interested to buy some, you know, locally grown uh, trees, that, that's a really great place to go. Next slide, please. Yeah, so through Tree Outside Woodlands, um, they're also trialing this um, scheme to fund trees, uh, but it's especially um, for farmers that have large or small land holdings. Um, so the fund can, the grant can fund up 200% of the cost of trees. And we can also provide 50% subsidy for tree protection and labor. And it's fairly flexible. So I think you can definitely speak to, um, to the team about what you want to do. But uh, it could um, cover, you know, if you want to plant trees in field corners, in field trees, agroforestry projects, uh, orchard, shelter belts and the hedgerows are the kind of stuff that we would be looking for. But as I said, it's fairly flexible. And now you can see the, the whole um, email. Uh, if you're interested, you could contact tree.project at norfolk.gov.uk for more information. Next slide, please. So I've talked a lot about kind of trees outside woodlands. Uh, so far, but we're really also working on supporting woodland creation. And for this, NCC has partnered 
with Norfolk FWAG, so who is a farming and wildlife advisory group. Um, if you want to plant woodlands, it can be quite um, complex. So I think to have free advice from FWAG is a very good opportunity for landowners. Um, so they are really looking, they, they can really provide support for any plantings that are over uh, 0 0.5 hectares. Um, and basically, if you're interested in woodland create, you know, creating a new woodland or to extend a woodland, um, you would need, you, there are possibility to apply for some funding, but there are quite complex applications to uh, put together. Uh, so there are the more woods applications, uh, the UCO application, uh, depending on the size of the woodland that you want to create. Um, and this is where the, you know, having free advice from FRAG is, is really supportive. So again, there's an email address uh, to contact FRAG directly. And you can also see the FRAG website on that slide. So hopefully, um, once you get the slide, you'll be able to access all those um, links. Yeah, and finally, we also really wanted to include really anyone in Norfolk who have planted trees to support and contribute towards the target of planting 1 million trees in Norfolk. So we have created an online form that everyone can uh, fill up. So anyone who has planted trees already um, can fill this form. Um, it takes into consideration natural coloniz colonization. So obviously, if if some trees are growing because um, you know you've got uh, the wind or animals, uh, it can be counted. And um, but the only thing that we can count is any trees that have been planted after November twenty nineteen. So after the one million tree project has been approved. So yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, and that's it. So uh, you have my contact details. So if you've got any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. And there's also uh, contact details of our main inbox, uh, just in case I'm not around. There's an e-newsletter that is really good. We're not trying to have too many. Um, but um, every quarter or so, we're, we're putting a news e newsletter just to update on the current offers that we have. Um, and you also have a link towards the general 1 million tree project uh, website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, yeah, so any questions? Uh, thank you very much, Ellen, Tom, and James, for everything you said. I have to say, half, halfway through Tom's Tom's presentation, I was getting very depressed. I was I was starting to think, this, have I suddenly morphed into a Doctor Who episode where we're all being invaded by these uh, fairly unpleasant looking creatures, which would which would do nasty things to the environment and and potentially with the last one, certainly with nasty things to us. But it's nice to hear there are some positives out there. Indeed, you know, I was really pleased to listen to Helen describing some of the the different types of funding and the different things that can be encouraged and 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 assisted. Uh, around the county and I'm sure uh, lots of people will uh, will want to take part in that um, so really it's a it's it's question time now or observation time if anybody's uh, got any questions you know put your hand up either, either virtually using the uh, hand raising function down at the bottom of the screen or I, I will try and spot if anybody actually have puts a puts a physical hand up and uh, and hand over to you Anybody got a, got a question? Oh, well, 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 oh, Nigel, over to you. Thanks, Pete. Uh, thank you all for the presentation. It's really interesting. I just wanted to um, draw attention to something, but also to ask a question, if that's all right. Um, I'm in Haveringland, which is about 10 miles north of, of Norwich. And um, I'm involved in a project which is in its early days, but it's basically trying to take uh, what James is referring to, a landscape scale approach to nature recovery. 
and the area that we're looking at, and I'm really interested if anyone is here tonight from area, you know, the area that I'm talking about to um, hear about uh, whether you might be interested in, in joining us. The area stretches from the outskirts of Reefham across to Causton and across to Aylsham, and again, the outskirts, and stretches down to the outskirts of Norwich. So anywhere in between that, those three uh, towns and villages and Norwich um, is potentially of, of interest and could, could get involved. Uh, I'll put my email address in the chat and, you know, would be happy to, to uh, hear from anyone. My question really is, I suppose, um, to to Tom and, um, well, principally to Tom, but maybe to Helen, about climate change. And um, what I was wondering, Tom, was whether um, the pattern of diseases is, is likely to change with climate change, but also going on to what Helen was talking about, which is planting new trees, whether we, our thinking has moved on so that we're now thinking about which species we should be planting to take account of climate change in the future. Thank you. So, Tom, that's over to you, I think, basically. Yeah. Um, hi, Nigel. Thanks. That's a, a brilliant question. Um, and uh, yes, climate change is playing a big part. Um, the change in, in weather patterns is is um, messing stuff up a bit. Um, it's causing stress to, to, to trees and they're behaving in ways or having to respond to stimulus that they're not used to. Um, so that's that stress is enabling more diseases to, to you know, to, to take hold. Um, and there is great debate on the best way to, to, to manage this. Um, so uh, there's a, a camp in essentially the Forestry Commission um, who've done a host of research on on climate change and they they really advocate um, um, species that live uh, that currently thrive in in um, climates which are predicted to, to to be ours in you know in the future so 2050 2080 and beyond you know what's what's Norfolk can, climate going to be like then um, they've got tools there's a really good um, 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 bit of software called the ecological um, classification tool um so if you look on forest research and and type that in then you can look to see what your uh your particular area is going to be like in the in the future and what trees are going to be um able to thrive there um so that on the face of it seems like a brilliant idea um the the downside to that is um we would have all sorts of unusual trees in our landscape so there'd be as a visual and cultural element to that that we're just not used to seeing that that change that progression you know going through um and also um wildlife um the, the suite of wildlife that we've got here at the minute doesn't thrive on those um you know what you might call non-native um trees um yet <laughs> But that wildlife is going to move as well. Um, and yeah. at the minute, it's a really it's, it's really difficult. Um, Organisations like the Woodland Trust um, are, are, are really keen on tackling climate change by manipulating the local environment. So where you've got a really dry, you know, um, um, you know, sort of desert landscape um, um, that's really prone to the impacts of, of climate change, you can reduce that, you can make it cooler, you can make it damper, you can improve the soil conditions um, by planting trees and woodlands. So you can change an area that is, you know, like a desert into an area that is is actually more like a, a the typical English um, um, sort of uh, um, microclimates. Um, so that's, that's quite a strong argument as well. Um, our approach at the minute is to sort of not rock anyone's boat in a way. So we've got a, a um, um, our main recommendation is in the in the towns and cities, kind of do what you like. You know, it's really good place to have some exotic species there. Um, towns and cities are quite harsh places for trees, so you want to choose species that are able to adapt to those conditions. Ones that already exist in the natural environment, as you know, places that are. are, are droughty poor soils sometimes get waterlogged deal with pollution all that kind of stuff um in the rural environments um at the minute it's it's um it's more successful i suppose is the best way to phrase it to stick with a predominantly native suite of trees for for all sorts of reasons um but i, I say there are strong arguments for for, for putting non-natives in our countryside as well and then the bit between that kind of peri-urban area 
um, have a bit of a mixture. So you've got that transition um, between between the countryside and um, and the city. Now, I think you might have asked something else, Nigel, but I've forgotten. Well, no, just really about the uh, the range of trees that are available now, whether those yeah. um, are reflecting really what you've just talked about, that, that we we have available the more exotic varieties, yeah. species that are going to cope better with, you know, what we can expect to, to hit us more and more in the future, really. Yeah, so th those those varieties are are available. There are nurseries that sell them, reputable nurseries, um, that can sell them from seed that's been sourced in the UK. So a lot of these non-native trees exist here already. You know, um, and particularly in you know, uh, uh, landscaped areas. You know, the church was an early adopter of of of, of unusual or foreign trees. London plains, etc., were first um, brought brought into the the, the sort of Church of England. Um, um, so yeah, it's possible to source um, um, these more exotic trees without that risk of, of pest and disease introduction. Um, another option is to is to use the same tree species that we've got, so our you know um, oaks etc., but to 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 gather the seed from you know the Mediterranean, um, where the same species is growing. It's evolved to grow in a different climate and to 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 match that. So you've got that provenance element. Um, and that's another thing that, that the Forestry Commission is good at matching. Um, and actually, the the uh, west coast of, of of North America is a similar kind of climate to 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 ours um, at the minute. And that's where the Douglas fir and things like that have come through. That's um, so sort of thrives so well at the minute. They've just just taken a um, a climate that's either current to ours or if we're looking into the future you find a spot that's going to be similar to our future climate and and you borrow some of the the diversity from there um, i think the answer the short answer is is go to a reputable supplier and and take advice yeah okay i, I think it's time we move on we've got a few other people lining up with questions so i want to give everybody a chance so sally ann you're next in the you're next in the queue thank you very much and thank you again to all the speakers um I'm a tree warden for, for Bramerton, uh, which has uh, the whole of 185 households in the parish. So it's very small in terms of its income. But we are very lucky in that we have some 360 uh, trees on parish land. And these are mainly um, a, a very mature oaks. So the problem for us is not planting trees. But just in a recent uh, one part of our our, our, our boricultural um, assessment to look at work that needs to be done in terms of risk by roads, um, just for a very few trees, the estimate is something like ten and a half thousand pounds, which is pretty much the annual budget for the parish. Uh, so, are there any uh, resources or ways that we can manage the trees that we've got? Uh, of course, we are also trying to plant new trees, but we're really rather constrained by just being able to manage these really beautiful oak trees. I think that's probably one for you, Tom, as, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, no is the, 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 the rather frustrating answer. Um, budgets are tight across the board and um, we um, we just don't have the, the, the budgets available within the county council um, to support privates and um, privately owned trees um, unfortunately there are ways that you can reduce your management costs um, so you know, you're doing exactly the right thing by having your trees surveyed um, so you can then start some some sort of planned interventions so it might be that um, if a tree needs to be felled um, you could you could flag that up in advance and um, uh, 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 fell that in a, a, a time of year that's going to be um, easiest. So that might be into a, um, a, a field, a farmer's field, when it's, you know, in that short window when it's fallow between, you know, harvest and, and, and sowing. Um, and the other thing that you're doing, which is is fantastic, is is it looks like you're starting to manage your tree um, uh, your trees on a population level so you're looking at the whole of the the um, suite of trees that you've got and and planting the next generation so it's a real problem in the rural um, setting at the minute we've got loads of magnificent um, oak trees in particular on our farmlands and they're they're succumbing to a variety of of, of, of issues um, and they're also just a bit old some of them you know um, um, and there isn't that there aren't those new trees to to, to replace them 
Um, so if you're if you're able to 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 start sort of churning over the stock a bit, then that's 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 a way you can do that. Being ever so mindful not to um not to just you know preemptively fell wonderful trees that support a lot of habitats you know that's valuable for wildlife um it is really it is really difficult um unfortunately um so yes no is the straight answer sorry sorry about that sally Ann. right angela you've, you've been waiting very patiently to to ask your question thank you um angela bishop um terence st john parish council um the um Trees on farm scheme. Um, I'm wondering, does that actually extend to um, other landowners as well? Parish council, we don't have much land as, at all. We've got a playing field, which obviously is a playing field. Um, but we have quite a few, for example, people with equestrian properties um, in town of St John. Is um, would the trees on farm scheme? extend to that or is it solely for farmers that have got quite a few farms as well but um i'm not sure we can persuade them to plant trees we can try helen that's probably one for you yes thanks angela um the short answer is i'm not sure but it's something i can ask the partners of the project um, currently, we were focusing on farmers, but actually, it's quite a good point from you that maybe other landowners could be interested. So I will ask the question, um, and hopefully, I'll have your email uh, once, Pete. If you send an email around, I should find your email, Angela. Well, the, the, the emails will certainly be available on the presentation, but I'll, I'll make myself a little note to, to yeah. connect, connect you to outside of the meeting afterwards. So perhaps you can you can chat about this further and, and go into the details. Oh, all all I would say, Ellen, is, is to put a plea in for, for asking whoever's making the decisions about where the funding goes to be as liberal as possible with uh, with the type of type of organizations that might be supported because i think i think trees need as much as much help as they can possibly get with sure. from, from a number of uh things coming in okay so i'll, I'll connect you to others and Anne edwards you've, you've been sitting there waiting very patiently as well yeah you? hello well sally ann introduced my question quite nicely and because south norfolk has got a really impressive network of tree wardens throughout the parishes of South Norfolk. And these are people, you know, this is a, a, a scheme that's been going on for decades. And these people have a wealth of experience of knowing their local trees and uh, landowners who are prepared to, to plant trees. And every year between us, we plant thousands of trees, but we, we, we have to get our own funding. Is it now time to link? with Norfolk County Council and say, come on, let's um, combine our forces here. We we know the landowners, you've got the funding, let's get together and plant the million trees for Norfolk. Just saying. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that one quickly, yes. <laughs> but I, I don't know if, if if James or Tom wants to come, come in on that and, and, you know, whether you've got any words of encouragement, I suppose, as much as anything for Anne and the rest of us. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, and that would be, you know, that would be, you know, fantastic. Um, um, we aren't as engaged with the tree wardens as we could be. Um, that's 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 for certain. Um, but all of our offers sort of extend there, and we welcome any ideas. Um, for you know, opportunities. If funding doesn't exist at the minute, then, um, you know, uh, we can look for funding. Um, some of the barriers to actually, um uh securing funding is is having the the um the locations for trees um to 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 go as much as anything else um in the past we we have tried to um um link up with tree wardens to um apply for some of these larger grants um um but it's it's quite tricky it's a really onerous task to to fill in the paperwork and actually some of the um some of the requirements of that funding is quite onerous as well which is a real a real barrier um uh you know the reporting of it photographing logging the geolocating you know etc is is has been a barrier um which is one of the reasons why um we've uh, uh set up our own sort of initiatives that are because it's largely our 
our funding, we're able to dictate what the rules are a little bit. And obviously we want stuff to survive. We want evidence to show that it's going going well. Um, but we we don't it doesn't come burdened with the same same requirements. But um but yeah, absolutely. If you've got some ideas and then then please send them through. Yeah, I said tree wardens like planting trees, they don't like yes. paperwork. That's no, the bottom absolutely. line. Yeah. <laughs> well, well actually, yeah. actually none of us do it. I, I'm picking up on that. I, I I think there are other useful connections that uh, at NCC, which which Tom may be able to help with, or indeed I can help with. Uh, if you go to our YouTube channel, which is where I'll be posting the the, the copy of the webinar afterwards, we we hosted a, a webinar. I think it was early last year, early early twenty two, um, from uh, Graham Phillips, who who can actually provide help to community organisations in terms of applying for not not just internal Norfolk County Council grants, but but other other grant funding bodies. Who, who who you know who may have sources of funds that that you might not otherwise be aware of and he can tell you how to 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 make a, a an application that has the best chance of succeeding obviously you can't guarantee that, that an application will succeed but he can certainly help groups um to to put in the best uh the best possible uh, application yeah. yeah we'll say that buses have been very generous to the tree warden network this year so we're okay yeah yeah that's good Glad to hear it because I bought my bought a car from them in the summer. So that... <laughs> there, there's a question been posted in in the chat actually, which is which is which is which is very interesting uh, because it raises the issue about about sort of controls and enforcement. So Anne, Anne on her iPad has, has asked what procedures are in place to stop people planting on otherwise good habitat, for example, flower rich meadows, heathland, coastal grassland, etc. Yeah. I don't know which which of you would like to pick that one up. I'm happy to pick it, but I'm conscious I've talked quite a bit. Um, That's okay. We enjoy we enjoy so, listening to you, Tommy. It's uh... <laughs> has a bit of luck, yeah. So, um, um, Helen didn't mention it in her in her um um talk, um, but we we do actually pose some restrictions on where um our trees can be planted. So we're not able to visit every site. We're really not able to visit any of them, to be honest, when we're looking at these small numbers of trees that are getting planted. Um, but what we do is we um, um, run it through a, a, a constraint checker. And um, the point of that is to try to avoid some of the big, you know, the big the big problems. So some, you know, um, um, uh, some features like, you know, county wildlife sites, triple SIs, um, water courses, um, roads, footpaths. Um, there's a whole host that we that we look through to to, to filter out, um, and any anything that that's that where people have applied for for tree planting in those areas, um, then we 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 have a sort of a, a deeper dive to to look to see if it's um, if it is appropriate. Um, we we do refuse um, planting um, um, in in some locations um, through that constraint check. Um, but it is quite hard to to really do that at a at a site by site um, basis, and that's where the the local nature recovery strategy I think is going to be really key, um, because that will that will you know um, um, really give a, a a positive nudge into where the the best planting locations are, um, um, you know, to avoid planting up on heathlands or or you know wildflower rich meadows um there's actually one 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 slide that popped up in elaine's um talk on the um um uh uh on planting on agriculture that agroforestry um um and it looked like a quite a nice heathy area um and and i was thinking oh that's not so great and then i thought well actually no this is this could be quite good if this is a grazed area that might be suitable for silver pasture where you're planting isolated trees for for the shade of the cattle that could be could be quite good um uh but yes that's 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 how we tackle it at the minute we try to follow um the guideline guidelines in the um uk forestry standard which is kind of like the the the, the complicated big guidebook on on where's a good place to plant trees um and we're we're definitely prepared to say no that's 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 um that's not right okay have you got any comments on that james or um um yeah no i think you've you've covered that nicely i, I yeah i think you're right the nature recovery strategy is going to kind of really start to steer where we want to see creating the right habitats in the right locations and you know we, we, we yeah there are going to be locations where it's not appropriate to plant new woodlands or um you know 
um, and, and vice versa. We want other habitats there. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's going to be really important. And it's something we're looking at also through biodiversity net gain as well. You know, we, we, we don't want to see for the same reasons, you know, uh, uh, you will need to sort of, a developer would need to make sure they are not planting woodland on uh, on, on on you know whether it's heathland or yeah flower rich meadows as you've said there just you know um those would need to be we need to have the kind of um pre-development surveys to make sure that you know to, so we we're aware of what the current situation is and that they're not being degraded in any way with inappropriate planting so yeah we're, we're looking at looking at it from that side as well yeah okay Another couple of questions posed in the posed in the chat. So I'll I'll go to James first. Uh, and she asks, is any effort being made to use biodegradable tree tree guards um, to to ensure there isn't you know a problem with plastic litter from discarded or in the future when when you know they're no, no longer needed. I'll start by saying I completely agree that it's I I really think it's an issue um, and in my role particularly through sort of the the you know um planning and development you do see a lot of landscape schemes where you know schemes have been implemented and they've not been maintained properly and guards have been left there for for years just to kind of break down and litter cause litter so i agree it's an issue i've seen some solutions for using alternative um sort of guards or looking at um alternative approaches such as sort of putting fences around the whole area of new woodland planting rather than individual plastic tubes um but tom's probably able to say a bit more about that than i than i am uh, i might hand over to tom if that's okay yeah yeah no thanks james so uh um yes there are there are alternatives um through our subsidized tree scheme we are offering um um tree spirals and and tree guards um and they are all um plastic free um it's a little bit of a tricky area because um not all of the products on the market work particularly well um um some of the ones that are uh, you know made of of more biodegradable material biodegrade a little bit too quickly um so uh yeah um but yes that that's james has hit the nail on the head there really if you've got a large woodland it's much better to vent it um um in some situations um there's also a wider question here about what you're protecting it from, um, the trees from, and there is a, a problem with um, an increase in in deer populations, you know, across the UK, but particularly in Norfolk. So, in effect, you're 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 trying to manage some of the symptoms by um, by guarding against mammals rather than the cause. Um, but that's a much that's a really tricky topic. That you know, um, um, because management of um of 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 deer is quite emotive and um it requires a joined up landscape approach across lots of of um of landowners um and it's not going to be something that's easy to achieve yeah i mean i mean just to jump forward a couple of the questions in the chat dave Dave has picked up on on this subject a bit which is you know says there has been talk of fencing off large areas to protect trees however that doesn't seem to align with the government's biodiversity policies you know, do, I, do any of you have any thoughts on that, about how you square that circle? Tom, James? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, there are there are other, uh, there are advantages of fencing off large areas. So um, planting trees, we talked about planting trees quite a lot. That's actually quite a bad way of establishing trees. Um, natural regeneration, letting natural processes take their course is, is um, often a much better way of of creating you know new woodland and it's much more successful and and can be a lot more resilient um so fencing off areas does allow a wider range of of uh you know unintended maybe plants to 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 come through um but it obviously is a barrier to to other wildlife um so i think with everything um a mixture of stuff is probably going to be the 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 best approach um you know excluding you know wildlife um particularly people to be honest is actually a really good thing sometimes uh, you know say wildlife you know excluding larger mammals um can be a really good thing in some places to avoid that disturbance um but uh, yeah you do want that mixture um mm-hmm. yeah and, and just to add yeah there are ways of um providing yeah kind of gaps access points for for small mammals for example to to get through fence signs so yeah it would be something we'd want to see happen if there were large areas being fenced off so yeah 
it's definitely something to think about. Mm. Um, and, and there was a comment I'd just see about working with deer management groups to, to talk about deer control. I think, Tom, that is something you've been involved with, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's um, At the minute, it's a slightly... Uh, um, we're in a, a slightly odd place at the county council in 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 that we have to be a little bit careful about how far our remit goes really um so the forestry commission's really the um the body that is um got the responsibility of managing you know private trees and and woodlands and encouraging those um so while the county council has has you know a role in you know managing its own property um and certainly trying to enable private landowners to support the aims of our environment policy um we just don't have the full resources to to to, to really you know um um set up projects in the way that maybe we'd we'd like um um but yes we we when we're creating woodland we on a larger scale and um, certainly you know deer management is um is in 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 our in our sort of sites and um um if we can work with local groups then then that's brilliant i suppose the the thing that we'd need like to know is is what would um you know what would local deer groups want from from us how can we support them um i think the the backbone to everything with 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 mammal management really is is understanding what the populations are and what the pressures are um to get good good um uh, sort of mm-hmm. baseline data so yes whoever that whoever's in the chat yeah we can certainly um have a chat about it yes yeah i mean i, I mean if, if if you'd like to to have further chat with tom or james or yeah. ellen if if you post your um um email details in in the chat uh and who you'd like to talk to or if if it's everybody then i i, I can pass those emails along as, as i as i offered to to angela early i can put put you in touch with uh with individual officers because there's obviously a lot of things that could be talked about and we, we've only got a limited uh, amount of time tonight um sally ann mentions again the issue the issue about and which i suppose is obvious really that actually the best trees to have are the are the mature trees that are already there and there's an issue about protecting what we've got as much as as much as planting uh, as planting new and, and allowing them to to grow and to and to regenerate and and sort of create offspring naturally um I don't know, Ellen, whether you've got any thoughts about the suggestions she makes about whether Pride in Place grants or or whether Graham, I, I don't know, you, you you know Graham, would would be appropriate to approach. In yeah, I to those schemes do not. So I'm not aware about the Pride in Place grant. Uh, I'm happy to to have a look, uh, but uh, I know Graham, and yeah, I know he's been able to help with external funding. So I think it's worth to contact him definitely. Mm. Again, I can, I can, I, if anybody wants to 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 have Graham's contact details, I can, I, I can share those as well. Um, Anne makes a point about: Do you think that again the question almost answers itself? But do you think there are enough local people able to survey their sites, and and where can they go if if somebody's interest interested? Where could they go to to learn more and and to become involved? I don't know which, which yeah. of you might have a have any any pointers that they can offer people as where to go if they want to become more involved. I know. Okay, that, that's obviously a question yeah. that stumped <laughs> our three speakers. So what I'll say then, if you're interested in doing that, contact me, and I will pass your details through uh, to our three speakers. We've already heard from and, and Alana, who's been who's been running the uh, running the presentation in the background, and make sure that those details are passed on, and we'll try to find out. Um, I actually had a had a had a a couple of questions I wanted to uh, to ask you, James, about the um, sort of biodiversity net net gain. Mm. It seems to tie in quite closely with the planning system, which I know I know vexes an awful lot of people. And and you know there's there's lots of conditions uh, and requirements that get placed on developers and planners and people and things that are associated with different orders and planning permissions. But if if that's breached, so if if somebody promises that they they're going to, um, you know, achieve a, a net gain associated with their development, who who's checking to make sure that's happening, and who's who's gonna who's gonna gonna do something about it if it doesn't happen? Yeah, that's a really good point, and this is a, a an emerging new situation because, as I said, you know, all new developments are going to have to start to meet this requirement. So, um, 
you know, that we haven't got many examples at the moment, but essentially it will be the usual planning enforcement route. So, you know, where it's it be whoever the local planning authority is, so whether that's ourselves at the county or the district council who'll be dealing with the majority of residential development, they will they will enter into an agreement with the developer. It will be a legal agreement. So they will, you know, it'll be a binding agreement. They will need to deliver whatever it is, you know, plant so many trees or create a, a new meadow or something. Um, they'll be required to provide regular monitoring reports back to sort of demonstrate that yes, they're on track to, you know, to 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 create that habitat. So and that's like I said, over a 30 year period. So at any point over that time, if we're not happy that they're not, you know, that reneging on their agreements, we can go there and take, you know, take measures to address those issues or, you know, as a kind of last resort, you know, to take those sort of enforcement measures. So there will be quite strong mechanisms in place to make sure this this is delivered. So that that's the sort of message really is, yeah, we, we will be making sure that uh, they do what they say they're going to do, wherever we can, yeah. If you can, I, I, I don't want to, be a wet blanket at this, at this, at, at, at this, at this point. But I was, I was at a meeting fairly recently, which was, which was about a diff, completely different subject. But there was a, a problem that had been caused by a developer who'd done some developments a number of years ago. They'd set up a management company, post the development to look after some of their requirements that were attached to the development, mm. and the the management company had gone bust, and and yeah. no, no, but nobody was accepting responsibility for the, for yeah. the on, on, on ongoing um, commitments. Because because yeah. this management company had gone bust, and the, the, as far as the developer was concerned, they washed their hands of it and passed it. Yeah, else. That, that's it. No, these management companies that that you you often hear of these stories, and I think it's yeah really frustrating. And most of the time, it will come back to the to the local authority to pick up the pieces and uh, try, try and deal with the situation. So yeah, it's not it's not great. Um, but yeah, like I say. Yeah, we're early days with this, but hopefully we can sort of learn those lessons from those sort of experiences and make sure we are um, entering into agreements with with you know with the right organisations. I, I think what we'll actually do is rather than be entering into agreements with individual developers necessarily, it might be with a you know where they're creating habitat, uh, uh, you know where, where it's a landowner. We'd be entering into agreement with with that you know provider of the habitat rather than the, rather than the developer. So. It might be that it's with, like I said, you know, a, a, an individual landowner, or um, it might be the Wildlife Trust or something like that. So hopefully, there's kind of that a bit of assurance that they are a long-term organisation rather than just a a management company that we don't know will be there forever. So yeah, mm. that's a good I, point. I, yeah, I, I, I suppose. I suppose my, my my appeal is that whoever is is making those decisions needs to be a wee bit cynical about the. Uh, yeah. Some, some of the promises that are, that are made, you know, promises are easy to make when you're you're trying to get uh, yeah a, a development on the books and get it agreed, but they're you know they're not so attractive or not so easy when you get ten years down the line and people haven't been doing what they're, mm. they're supposed to do. I, mm. I just got I, I just got one last quick question just just to make sure that I, I'm fully understanding. I'm presuming that the the requirements for biodiversity net gain only apply to new developments, so developments that have already been agreed, there won't be any retrospective yeah. requirement for them to. Yeah, no, definitely. You're absolutely right. So there will be a cutoff point. Um, so we've not been told an exact date yet. Um, so they've said January 24. We we imagine that, bear in mind, the guidance was due to come out in November this year, and we're on the 29th. I expect it'll be the, the 31st of January. Um, sure. But yeah, it will only be new applications coming into um you know to the local planning authority from that moment onwards so it won't be ones which are even being in the process of being determined it'll only be new ones so yeah that that's sort of how it's going to work so expect um, a flurry a flurry of applications <laughs> yeah in, in, yeah in the next six weeks yeah and sorry just one other thing pete i've just noticed a comment from angela about um whether we comment on emerging neighborhood plans and we, we do we do get um we do see those come across our desks. So wherever possible, we do review those in terms of not only biodiversity, but also trees and woodlands and, and, and landscape issues as well. So we do look at those, yeah. Could I just ask that you let me have your email address because yeah. I'm involved in a rewrite of a neighbourhood plan and I would love to have your comments on what we've mm. put in there. That would be really helpful. Yep, I think I'm sure we can arrange that, Pete, can't we? Yeah. Indeed, I'm, I'm, I'm just making myself yeah. a note, Angela, to 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 send you over 
uh, contact e contact details. There are some contact details already, as I said in the presentation, and those links will be active, so you can make use of those. But I I will uh, I will send you the the direct contact links, Angela. And again, as I as I mentioned before, if anybody else would like like those, please put them in the chat now, because unless anybody has got anything pressing further, I would just like to say thank you again to uh, James, to Tom, and to Ellen for. Uh, a, a real plethora of really fascinating information tonight and and some pointers to to lots of things that, that that we can become involved in and thank you very much to alana sitting in the background behind her blank screen for controlling the presentation but most of all thank you all very much for making the time this evening uh to come along and take part in this i i, I hope you 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 feel it's been a, a, a useful spend of your time um and hopefully i will see you again soon on some of our other projects and uh, enjoy the rest of your evenings thank you very much Thank you. Thanks. Really lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good night.